Welcome to We're Not Wizards. We are the best, but not wizards. Enjoy the show! to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for April. And I cut the grass, well, I cut the front grass for the first time tonight. It was, it was uh, with my new lawnmower, which was fantastic. Um, it's kind of nice. It's kind of nice when you get some kind of like shiny new equipment to just go out there and cut the grass. I was cutting the grass like an absolute boss. It was the first time using my lawnmower and I couldn't understand why everybody finds cutting the grass so difficult. Um, rather like today's guest, who's jumped onto Kickstarter. <laughs> With a world <laughs> insect. Don't, don't interrupt. Who's <laughs> jumped onto Kickstarter. I'm not finished. You made me lose my track. Who's jumped onto Kickstarter. Like a person who's standing there with his new lawnmower, cutting away at that grass and wondering why everybody else is struggling. Um, and then he's just leaving them in a kind of a ring of fire, you know, and he's standing there wearing his crown of ash. <laughs> he's throwing out these cards. They're not kind of light cards. They're kind of dark cards. You can say they're almost like card noirs. <laughs> so joining me from card noir to talk about crown of ash, but not mentioning whether or not he's done any gardening. I've got Richard Lawton. Hello. Hello. How you doing? Um, I don't actually have a garden, um, so uh, yeah, very envious of you your, your lawnmower. I, is it a ride-on lawnmower? It's not, it's not that big. It's just right. I was saying it. I was talking last night. Um, I was recording last night um, with somebody else, and I just I was kind of telling them my. Uh, and this is going to kind of sound strange because it's going to be like depending on the order of when I put this out, this one's probably going to go out before the one that actually has the story about how it got the lawnmower. So this is like the Christopher Nolan of podcasts in which what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by telling you what happened and then in the next episode you're going to find out. This is like the tenet, my tenet of podcasts is that we're going to work our way towards the middle and then we're going to go backwards again. You're going to discover in the next show how I came to get my lawnmower in the first place. But no, it's not a sit-on lawnmower. It's like, it was just like, it's top of, it's not top of the range, but you know how when you go and buy something and you kind of like do like a, this'll do. Do you know what I mean? You're kind of like, well, this'll do. I'll get the middle cost one because the, the, the high cost one's just far too expensive. And the low cost one, I know I'll break after three months. So I'll get something in the middle. But the place where I got yeah. the lawnmower had a really kind of more like expensive one but it was really really reduced i had 15 percent off so i went and got that so i was out trying it tonight so there you go so amazing so anyway enough <laughs> enough about <laughs> <laughs> enough about you do have a lovely collection of plants though i do well they're they're not doing so well so this is the thing so living in a, a london mm. flat with no garden mm. kind of get their kind of indoor indoor plants going but they never seem to kind of thrive they they sort of start off really nice from wherever i get yeah. from like garden center yeah. and then it's like a slow decline into oblivion and then they get replaced so they look okay at the minute but they don't look as good as they did a year ago and in a year's time they'll probably be you dead. talk to them so, um sort of whisper to them <laughs> just like the plant whisperer do like Just uh, yeah, take out my, my, my Kickstarter campaign frustration on is it Is it potentially because if you're actually bringing in kind of lots and lots of cardboard, they're looking at the kind of the cardboard and going, Hope they're going like this, they're going like, it's going to be us next. You just mark your words if he runs out of prototypes. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, what happened to Danny? I don't know, Danny was here, he was looking a bit poorly, and the next thing we know, he disappears in this like kind of board game kind of <laughs> turns it. up. So it, kind of... it doesn't help having cats as well. Like, the cats just kind of make it their mission to sort of slowly 
destroy everything and the plants seem to be a key thing so they're kind of probably deflecting a lot from mm. sort of nicer stuff so actually you know, sacrificial plants so is that is that you're um, kind of basically kind of saving your clothes and your legs <laughs> and your dinner and probably carpets and everything for and the sake really how many how many I cats have you got I've got two two cats um which uh, feature quite heavily in some of the game stuff because if they're ever taking a picture mm. of playing a game, they tend to be sort of near or on top of the game or pushing something important off the table. Um, but yeah, two two cats, very kind of active, noisy cats. You might hear them squealing in the background. I'll, edit, I'll edit them out. <laughs> <laughs> I won't edit them out. I was saying, I've got this chance of my, my dog at the moment, he's kind of settled because he's just been for a walk and it's been like a hot day. A hot-ish day, which is why I got my grass cut. And um, he's just lying there now, so hopefully he's going to be chill and everything's kind of going to be fine. Um, let's let's put the way the way back the way back clock a little bit way back because what we like to do on this show is we want to we like to find out a little bit about the shiny crown of the past before we f- step into the fiery headpiece of the present and the crown of ash of the future. So just going to find out a little bit more about can you yourself. I'm personally, I'm a bit, I'm, <laughs> oh my goodness, it's going to sound like, uh, what's his name? Norman Osborn and Spider-Man. I'm a bit of an artist myself, but um, <laughs> a bit of an idiot myself. Um, I'm not saying you're an idiot. That kind of came out wrong. That didn't work. Um, but I think this is a stupid observation. No, I'm not saying, yeah, I'm not saying, not um, saying a word. Um, <clears throat> Art, right from from your background, and I'm not going to go through your background because that's up to you, up to you to tell me your background because that's how it kind of works. But mm-hmm. you're quite, you're an artistic, creative type person, and has that always been the situation? When, like, when you were growing up as a young child, were you were you the kind of kid who was happiest with 15 pages of like A4 white paper and a set of crayons or a set of paint or just a set of pencils and you would just like draw cars and planes and boats and horses and all that type of thing or you know swords yeah yeah I think so the um yeah I remember I kind of always used to raid um kind of the bathroom bin for like toilet roll tubes and um, my mum used to have these kind of um saline little plastic saline tubes that look kind of like rockets. What was that for the contact, um, the like contact female, lenses? All oh, right. Yeah. And um, she got so annoyed with me kind of going through the, the, the bins that she then have like a separate pile just for me to kind of um, take and make into stuff. Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Always been a creative person um, and probably, uh, probably more creative than I am sort of academic and things like yeah. that. So it's one of those things where you go to school and um, they don't really put a lot of kind of praise on being good at kind of creative stuff. Um, so it's sort of like no one goes up to you and says, uh, it's like, oh, you're you're doing badly at drawing. So, um, you know, you're going to have to stay behind and practice. You can be terrible at drawing and terrible at being creative and you're going to find if you're bad at kind of maths and English, then you've got, you've got an issue. But um so yeah always been creative always i think it's i kind of attitude to being pretty dyslexic um uh which is sort of a positive thing i think when it comes to stuff like rule book writing yeah, and things like yeah. that um strangely enough was it uh was was a school kind of one of these situations where if you were doing like when you're sitting in your english class you're like going i really this is really putting me on a downer because it would have been frustrating more than anything else if you're looking at stuff and the English teacher's like saying well it's obvious it's this and you're like going it's not you might as well be telling me try to tell me to write in kind of hieroglyphics because this isn't making any sense and then going into your art class we are just like this I am I am king of all of I survey <laughs> and kind of thing but you're you're right about the creative thing I think um it was interesting the other night <laughs> the other night and um uh, my partner's watching this like show on TV, the one about the they get the singers to dress up 
and I can't remember if it's called Superstar or whatever. And basically, they get three people who are going to be like Meatloaf or Robbie Williams or Cher or something like that. And they dress them up and then they have like a sing off. And then there was like this one person that's like singing like Adele, and it turns out like she's like a primary school teacher. And oh. my wife turns to me and she goes, Oh, just think of that. It's just, it's just like she's like so amazing. She should be so good. She should have her own show. And I says, Yeah. Imagine if we weren't kind of held in a big capitalist society and people who were actually good at creative stuff could just go out and say, I'm a singer, yeah. I'm a dancer, I'm an artist, I'm really, really good at tap dancing. Watch me reach my kind of pinnacle instead of them going, I'm currently having to work in a, in a, in a job just to make sure I've got kind of like shelter over my head. But I'm being a communist now. So there you go. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, being a school, I can see crossover skills of being a school teacher, that kind of booming school teacher yeah. voice that um definitely kind of things okay but, i can see how you have a, a like sort of very loud booming projecting voice um but this person was an that. amazing they're like literally an amazing singer and it's just like if mm. you if i said to you here's 25 30 40 grand a year you just go off and do what you do you know you'd never know you'd never know kind of what they achieve but that that's quite interesting it's like um i always think there's a sort of a bit of a difference in being sort of uh, creative and being good at like a craft. They're almost like there's crossover, yes. but you can um, like some people can be really good at say um, uh, kind of realistic style painting or something yeah. like that. And um, there's it, it can be more of a kind of a skill set and a craft um, as in like you're mastering the paints and realism and things like that. I think they might not have the kind of creative stuff of someone who's very kind of abstract, who maybe can't paint, but then could be incredibly creative. So it's kind of a weird thing of having like, um, you can absolutely, I think, have a really good skill in something, something like singing. Yes. Singing. Yes. You could be an amazing singer, but not be able to write a yes. song. Yes, no. Um, and you can be a terrible singer, but be an amazing songwriter. I mean, you've got plenty of those yeah, out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also I think in, when it, in relation to art, I know there's there's some people that you can ask them to copy a particular style or mm. you know you get you give them still life drawings and they'll just pump them out left right and center but if you say oh. to them right imagine I want you to from imagine a futuristic landscape they're like going no no yeah. I'm just you know they they've, they've kind of got they've got like you said they've kind of got the skills and then but they've not the kind of the I guess the the ability to look at a situation and kind of create it from nothing, I think, is like a, a different mm -hmm. skill set kind of altogether. So, yeah. did you left school and did then you go and study kind of further at college or university or or anything like that? Yeah. So, coming out of school with my like very middling grades, mm -hmm. um, and then going into I went to college and studied graphic mm -hmm. design as my only subject, and that was amazing because suddenly like okay, I, I'm kind of good at all my subjects now, um, <laughs> which was the first time ever. Um, and uh, yeah, that was really good. So I kind of left school, kind of, what, is it, what are we, 16? Straight into college to do graphic yeah. design. And, and I've been doing that ever since. So I went to, to university and did graphic design as well. And uh, left, went straight into a job after uni, um, doing kind of, yeah, graphic design branding stuff, um, which is one of those things I think this kind of, it, graphic design is one of those ones where you will be pulling all these kind of creative individuals together mm. potentially graphic designers are those kind of people who are really creative but not necessarily always particularly like skilled themselves in say like an illustration style or yeah, something like that yeah um and that's actually a really good thing for um being able to kind of pull the people you need um you think okay um you can look at say like like a game if you take game concepts you can kind of come up with a theme and think, okay, there it could be this style mm. or it could be this. Style. You're not kind of nailed down to one type. And I think that's, that's a really good kind of uh, thing about being kind of graphic designer is you kind of not um, weighted down to one style or something like that. Um, I mean, the graphic design obviously varies quite a lot. People do have their kind of own specific style, but the kind of work I did wasn't, was I went and did kind of very corporate stuff yeah. um, at uni. Uh, which is probably why I kind of started doing game design a bit of a, you know, proper creative outlet for the corporate stuff is not always the most interesting. Is it like, kind of like, 
here's the logo, but we want to change the color slightly, move this like kind of slightly bigger, and kind of um, you know, I, I like the uh, the biggest, you like, know, the most late. I think the biggest, the thing that made me laugh out recently was them talking about the kind of the rebranding or the redesign of the BBC logo, and it turned mm. out all they did was they just tapped tab twice and moved the. <laughs> <laughs> move the letters yes. kind of a, a little bit wider apart and that's kind of all they seem to have done and goodness knows how much they would have spent kind of on meetings yeah. and graphic and kind of graphic designers kind of like pitching back and forward about what they were going to do for this thing stuff like like, like that kind of pains me because i have been in those situations where we have done a kind of uh it would be considered like a full-scale redesign mm. where the the right the right approach to the client will be Especially like the BBC, it's such an established company yeah. that changing that logo would be just probably the wrong thing to do. Yeah. And even if the client comes to you and says something like, uh, you know, we want to change the logo or like, you know, we want a full scale re- redesign of the whole brand, um, that might be the wrong choice. And you pay a decent design agency or, a, you know, um, a consultancy, uh, a decent amount of money to prove that that is the wrong choice so it might seem like going having almost the same logo is um you're like what have you paid for that you've paid for basically someone to look into everything yeah. and decide that that's the best course of action is to kind of almost stick with it but then there's also a lot of behind the scenes stuff to, to say branding um for a company stuff like tone of voice and uh, it's kind of visual language you call it which is everything that isn't the logo yeah um so logos, especially nowadays, logos are, I mean, it's kind of what I specialized in at Union. They're kind of, they've never been so unimportant. They used to be a really big deal back in the day when you used to have kind of letter-headed paper and things yeah. like that. And um, um, your communications were really kind of uh, some text and your logo. And that was like your company. Yeah. And now um, people see so much more from your company all the time. So they'll see, you know, your social posts, they see your... Um, uh, you know, th- even free stuff. It used to be that if you paid for a billboard, that's when you'd see a company's, you know, sort of external um, communications and you'd go, okay, that's their style. Whatever. But now you kind of see stuff all the time. Advertising super cheap, it's super accessible. Mm. Um, so yeah, these, the logo may not change, but everything behind the scenes may have changed. Um, and they may have explored new options for logos and they were just the wrong choice. I mean, this is, so yeah, I, I do... When you see these kind of things where i remember was it was it like haringey council or something it was like one of the london boroughs um did this horrendous logo redesign it it cost like three million quid or something. <laughs> i've got one better than that do you remember then royal oh. mail private got privatized and tried to change its name to cons- consignia <laughs> and it's almost like i start to is that post office or was it royal mail i think it was the actually i think it might have been the actual royal mail itself because i Mm. don't know if it's like one of those um what do they call it it's like an event where everybody thinks that it's actually happened it's mandela effect where you actually think you believe Mm. it's happened but it turns out it actually never ever happened at all and as and as time goes on i'm starting to think did the royal mail at some point kind of like in the space of six months do a complete name change, redesign, logo design, roll it all out, mm. and then roll it all back again. And, and they never, I don't think they ever got to the bottom of how much it costs. I think it was about, in, it was a lot of millions to kind of do that. Oh, oh yeah. Especially if they backtracked it. Because um, that was probably, the second. I always can see the, the logic behind these mm. things because I've been there in the, I, I can almost see the brief. I've been there so many times. I can see that they probably went, right, post office or Royal Mail is too restrictive. Mm. And people around the world want to be dealing with the Royal Mail. So we want something that's going to be global and it's going to basically mean they can take their brand and start doing effectively what, when you think of like um, DPD, which is, I think it's Deutsche Post. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We don't think about that because it's just DB. If they were, so they probably went, oh, we want to be the the Deutsche Post for the Royal Mm. Mail the consignia and alienated everyone <laughs> <laughs> who used the royal mail and then we're like yeah this isn't working um so i can see what happened there but yeah it probably be the wrong choice um yeah every every is the a great example of like how <laughs> you can just like basically put a new coat of paint over a, an absolutely failing company 
And um, just, just, we'll call it, we'll call it something. I heard somebody say, they've just poured another tub of glitter over the turd <laughs> that yeah. is Hermes, but no, they've not. The way it looks like the, the jumbling letters as well, where it's like, hey, I, I guess that's been, it's probably were like, yeah, it's going to mean that we kind of, we do a bit of everything. We're not one brand. <laughs> I, just, but actually, I just looked at it meant like chaos. <laughs> yeah, chaos. I just looked at it meant chaos. <laughs> it's like, it's literally like, the last time I seen anything like that was, uh, I don't know if you ever watched Loki on Disney Plus. And what they did is every single week, they basically had the Loki, the Loki kind of, this lovely kind of script font but then they changed the letters into different kind of fonts so it looked like it was obviously to, to, to represent the kind of the multiverse and it was to represent the fact that he was in a chaotic state of mind because he was meeting all these different kind of versions of himself and that was kind yeah. of like when I looked at every I just went what have you Nobody done? <laughs> what have you done? But it's either that or kind of I think is it the kind of ransom note we've cut letters out of a magazine? <laughs> so we've got, we've, 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 we've got, got your parcel. parcel. We want it. It's literally, <laughs> isn't it? Because I think, I think there's been jokes about people saying when they get a slip through the door or something, or they get the notification email. It's like it is literally like a ransom note. It's like we've got your parcel. It's like okay, how much do I need to pay you to make sure I actually get my parcel, <laughs> exactly. kind of thing? So that <laughs> just like, they're going to send you a little piece. Exactly. They're going to send it. you a meeple at a time. Yeah. So it. um, just moving on. It does is you know, it doesn't. I mean, if people want to go and talk board games, they can go talk board games. That's not the point of this. Yeah, we're talking. Just we're talking, talking branding, branding and my game. one of my friends, they design fonts for a living. And the stories oh, wow. they can tell you, and it's just, you know, one of these days I'm actually going to get them on the show just to spend an hour talking about f the importance of fonts and stuff like that, because mm. that's what they do. But where did the world of you and cardboard kind of start to collide? Because I think mm. it's a slightly different kind of approach from where maybe a lot of people kind of first got their kind of their, to cut their teeth on it. Um, in terms of sort of, uh, sort of game design stuff, um, I mean, I, I think I've been game design without realising mm. it for years. It's one of those things where I think a lot of people who are into board gaming and, and sort of end up becoming game designers um, have a similar thing where when you were stuck with the kind of bad board games you had as mm -hmm. a kid um, and you started house ruling them and things like that, effectively you're doing a bit of game design. Yeah. You know, you're thinking about... I don't like that rule and you know what can i do and that kind of stuff is i've just always done um and i hadn't really I, I only really got um brought into the world of kind of modern board gaming when sort of i met my my girlfriend and she was well, i say modern board gaming so her family have always played sort of slightly more advanced board games than i had i had like kaplunk and monopoly yeah. and um, some kind of really strange ones that I found in charity shops that I kind of thought, yeah, I'll get them and then just create my own rules. Um, but her family are really into, um, they kind of love talisman. If you've ever yes. Talisman. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those kind of like, I'd never played a game like it and they have got, I think it's the third edition or second edition. They've got like the, the one in the early nineties. And, um, it's such a beautifully broken game, but it's it's a lot it's of fun. Become a frog and then die. It's like it's like ring, <laughs> yeah, rings of hate, all the way all yeah. the way around. And it's just like it's the game. The game. The way the game. It's funny because it literally has expansions that expand the size of the game. That all it does mm -hmm. is it just makes it the external side of it kind of bigger. It is literally the yeah. an onion of a game, and I know. Um, um, I know J uh, John Cage from uh, Polyhedron Collider. He has always loved Talisman more than is healthy for a grown man who is now who is a father of two kids, um, and he will defend that game, you know, to his last breath. Yeah. Myself, I'm not too fussed. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is the same thing. My, my girlfriend loves it, and it's going to be things we play it like once a year for her birthday because oh, wow. that's all I can like bring myself to do, and it lasts about eleven hours. <laughs> um, but it is fun. It's it's one of those things where it breaks every modern 
sort of rule of board game is like you've got roll and move yeah. you've got a slight choice you can go left yeah. or right this is great um so you've got roll and move but you also have adventure decks which is incredibly random and that's what the expansions are ma- meant to i think fix is that they go well that one's hard and that one's sort of medi- medium it's like okay but the you can your first turn you can pick a like incredibly strong creature pops up and oh you 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 got you got injured or whatever <laughs> um there's like there's so many random elements to it um and you end up with these kind of 10,000 cards you have to keep track of you're like wait i've got this ability and this ability and then you become a toad and you drop everything and i think it's a great one if you if you've just become like your friend uh, a new dad it's a great one to introduce to your kids and be like here's the disappointment of life kids (laughs) (laughs) you become a toad don't come back inside it'll be talisman for the rest of the weekend (laughs) and be like oh no don't do that don't we're sitting here it's either that playing talisman you not finish your dinner? Talisman. <laughs> you get up at five o'clock in the morning? Talisman. And that's, that's. Yeah. I mean, this is, I think, right, I think that's a way to deal with discipline in schools as well. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> if you, you just keep interrupting the class, it'll be double talisman at the end of the day. <laughs> oh, no, don't do that. Not a double talisman. Single talisman. Yeah. You've got it up to talisman detention i mean that there's a there's an expansion for you it's it's one of those like guilty pleasure games i think when i first played it um i was like i was actually pretty impressed that it felt like a proper old school rpg sort of like a morrowind or a skyrim Hmm. in the game computer game world because you're if it feels especially like a sort of uh yeah like a a a skyrim thing because it feels glitchy and broken (laughs) and uh, sort of buggy, matched. but the, the bones are good and like i like the um if you're one of those people who's willing to do a bit of sort of role play in a non-role play yeah. game, get into the get into it i think it's i think it's got some good things to it like i really like it but i think that as my introduction to the sort of more modern games and um then obviously i was like wow this is incredible when i started looking out what else is yeah. out there but that one's one of those things that every time i come back to it knowing a bit more about what else is out there and being in the kind of design circles now i'm like oh god that's broken they're like oh that should be like this but i don't know it's 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 wonderful in its own way <laughs> but yeah i wouldn't i think if you designed it in 21st century it would um it would be panned on bgg um i i've seen so, i mean to be perfectly honest if they released it today there would probably be still be people that would defend it Especially if it had tons of minis. <laughs> if they kind of said, here's, yeah. here's a game, you put rings around it. And how many minis? It's got 178 minis, various different sizes, and it's like, quick, we've got to back out of the door. So how do you end up at Crown of Ash then? You... So this one was... So this is... I was banding around a lot of game ideas once I kind of got into the um, sort of thought, like, oh, I can... I can do this. This is easy. Um, I think every, I don't know if that's the kind of approach every game is on. It's like, yeah, this would be, this would be easy. I'll put it on Kickstarter. I'll make a million quid and then I just retire and play I mean, games. Or that's, like. Yeah. I mean, that is literally what Eric Lang tweets um, every Monday morning. <laughs> you know, this is the easiest job in the world. Uh, <laughs> just banked another couple of million. I don't know what to do with all this money. In fact, you know what? I tell you, the best place to go is if you'd want to have like a night where you don't pay for anything is hanging about with a group of fully funded Kickstarter successful board game designers because I tell you, they fight over themselves about who's paying for everything. Everything's top class and it's like you don't put your hand in your pocket all, all, all night. Uh, And then I woke up and it was a horrific yeah. fever dream. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's like you see that go to the house and all their furniture is just their on sold board games. <laughs> literally, it's all the, ki- it's all the Kickstarters the that they've backed. Created five, yeah. backed 723. Yeah, exactly. Because just like put, they put all the money they make from Kickstarter into other Kickstarters. Eric Lang's house is just, it's just. It's just ank. It is just ank. It's an ank. It's an ank doorway. It's got. Ca- it he's is. got. Ca- Case of the old world is his pension. 
You know, they all of a sudden yeah, disappeared crazy. overnight. They all disappeared overnight when Fantasy Flight, I think, stopped making them. See, so it's like he went into the warehouse and he was driving a truck with fifty thousand boxes. And then <laughs> and then there's like on the board sell on the board game groups on occasionally you get some guy popping up, you know, Derek Lang selling <laughs> selling an in shrink <laughs> copy of Chaos in the Old World for five hundred pounds. And that's what he does. I'm telling you. He's yeah, a, that's not a bad he's a dealer. I have to find that approach of Crown of Ash, like <laughs> like extreme limitedness so um tell us about the game i mean we're 30 minutes in to the podcast yeah, so yeah, <laughs> they, they i always I'm do actually... this though we kind of have a chat then it's like oh oh do we have to talk about the board game then so like, i shouldn't have really started a board game podcast really i'm kind of like can, i am the <laughs> i am the consignia of the board game podcast world but i kind of get halfway through and i go Oh, it was a mistake doing it about board games. I should have done it about something else. I should have just said, do you want to come on and have a conversation? But, you know, there you go. Um, What was the inspiration for Crown of Ash and what kind of game is it? So, so Crown of Ash is a work placement area control game. Um, so you play as sort of warring necromancers, um, which has a kind of thing of... Um, you, you play these necromancers... You're gathering resources by placing your workers out onto the mm. board. Um, you're building up the kingdom, which basically offers you, by building new buildings, you get um, more victory points at the end of the round, which is how it's called. Also, you give kind of uh, more resources to the, to the to everyone else on the board, so they can come to your spaces and you get a little reward if they mm -hmm. use your own your space and things like that. Um, and you're raising this army of undead uh, to your hand, and you use those to attack and control the different areas on the board which are these kind of victory point scoring buildings but the game started as inspired by like hell's kitchen uh, that sort of like gordon ramsay show oh right okay um, quite weird this is kind of the, the game design journey i mean like i started off thinking okay i want to do this kind of board game which is almost like farm to table sort of thing but with some hmm. uh, conflict so everyone controls say uh, a a resource for an ingredient mm. and then you have these customers to serve um and that kind of spawned the the idea okay so you've you've got to gather the ingredients and use those to to serve a customer and that'll give you a victory mm. points and the the ingredients you have you basically harvest your ingredients and i had this track at one point where the ingredients went from fresh to like rotten and after they were rotten they're in the bin and it was so they had this thing where it's more beneficial to like sell that ingredients to the other players. Yes. Um, and the freshness thing of if you sell kind of poor quality ingredients, there was a small chance that you could like poison the customer and something bad could happen. So that was that was the kind of initial thinking of the game. Um which is mad to think where it is now, it's so far away. But yeah, that was the initial thought. And I thought, okay, you need to have some kind of way of being able to take these ingredients because the, the otherwise the resources have to be all the same value and they have to be um it becomes very tricky to actually have some intertwining strategy other than just i'm sort of bartering with you yeah. which is always a tricky so i was like okay I need some way of going not controlling wholeheartedly all these resources and then a way of taking them off the other players so i was like okay it feels like it needs a battle mechanic or some kind of mechanic like that and I also thought that kind of the reward of just you've got the ingredients, you've exchanged them for a, a customer. Um, the idea being that all the players are competing for the same sort of customers. That felt a bit like, okay, you've got your card, you're going to score yeah. it, that's it. Yeah. So then I thought, okay, if it needs this battle mechanic, if those customers they like now are actually like sort of monsters, mm. uh, then you could recruit to your your army and then you can take the ingredients off to other people yeah. that feels cool um and there was this weird crossover point where i still had the kind of freshness of the ingredient which didn't really make sense which was like okay that doesn't really make sense um uh so that kind of maintained for a little bit when i was like no i'm scrapping mm. that and actually the the necromancer thing came from the idea of it being it was a bit kind of miserable when you initially had your fighters and you were attacking someone you lost and at one point you just discarded yeah. 
uh, and that was a bit sort of sad. You're like, oh, I just spent so much time yeah. uh, raising those. And so I was like, okay, what if you're sort of a necromancer and these are undead creatures and you're using alchemy, which is sort of the ingredients thing, makes sense. Uh, and then those can all come back to life at the end of the round um, because you're a necromancer. And actually, even though it's kind of became quite a dark theme, um, the that's sure the theme is to make the game sort of lighter and make things less punishing. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was the kind of foundations of it. It kind of morphed into this game about sort of being a, an undead necromancer. And, um, and then around the theme of it being not that punishing, of having this kind of mechanic where when you enter a battle with someone, win or lose, you always get something. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. It's very much the kind of Eric Lang sort of um, Loki oh, card in, again. in Blood Rage. <laughs> it just yeah, turns exactly. up. In relation to because your because your job, uh, because mm-hmm. you are le designer graphique. Yeah. Did you have to control actually creating our um, assets for the game? Because I can imagine that what happens is that you because normally, normally. My idea of game design is I've got 15 bits of paper with some numbers and a blob on it just to represent the different stuff. And I'm laying it down on a bigger kind of play mat and I just see if it works and play it back on. With you being a graphic designer, will you kind of have it? Is there any point where you actually said, look, I need to just concentrate on the game mechanics and making sure it works rather than, hey, look, I've just spent, you know, an hour and a half making these fabulous looking bread rolls for something that turns out you were never going to kind of use. Yeah, absolutely a blessing and a curse. I think in terms of the sort of actually mechanic mechanics of a mm-hmm. game, being a graphic designer just slows you right down yeah. because you can't help but want to make things look better than they need to be. Um, it's definitely at that, at that early stage where you just need to get yeah, like blobs on a piece of paper, basically. Yeah. You need to chop up some paper, you need to put some numbers on it, and you need to get it tested. I wasted so much time um, thinking about kind of, oh, art styles and all oh, and making it look really good um, when it was just nowhere near being done. Um, to the point where actually I think it's a, a negative as well, because if you show um, scraps of paper with biro on to someone and do a play test, they give you the feedback as if it's a first play test, right? So they're, they're thinking about the fundamentals of what's happening yeah. here. If you, like I was doing for a long time, um, properly de- trying to design stuff and, and it's, you know, even if I'm being quick, it looks quite, uh, it looks fairly put together. You know, you can, can make something fairly quickly look almost quite, um, professional. Mm-hmm. To, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, tell but, us how really good you are. Go on. <laughs> Go on. Yeah. But you get feedback as if it's further down the line, which sometimes is misleading. So someone will play a game, uh, when playtest the game, it's the first time you've playtested it and you've made it look fairly good and they'll be like, oh, this game's broken and they're, they're kind of surprised it, and it's almost like they'll have a really negative reaction to it. Where are you thinking... Yeah, you probably wouldn't have given me that same, or you would have given me feedback on a set, like a different level if I'd showed you pen and paper. I, th- so, I think that, is that not down to the fact that for a lot of the Kickstarter campaigns, a lot of the art is kind of like placeholder holder art. I've done my share of kind of previews for Kickstarters, mm. and mm. I would say a good 80% of them, they're like, please be aware that the the art is just like placeholder art and you know i know you see yeah. like one goblin and there's 16 of them but there is going to be different art for each of them it depends on how we kind of get kind of get funded so i can imagine if somebody's actually going through this and going this looks amazing then they are probably going to be like well this must be close i think because as i say it's one of the main one of the main i think one of the main sort reasons for people going to kickstarter is to kind of get art and the graphics and everything like that kind of funded mm-hmm. because you know art as we know kind of co- should cost money um yeah. you know um so so you held back that then you got to a point where you're happy with it and then did you pitch it to publishers 
Because I can imagine if you spent time, if you were there and went, right, I'm here, um, I'm happy, I'm ready to go with this, that you'd be able to rock up to like a publisher and say, here, this, I mean, I pretty much, you know, the art, you mm. don't, because I can imagine somebody getting presented with a game, unless they're deciding to completely reskin it and change the theme, the first thing they look at is, well, we're going to have to spend, you know, 6K, 7K, 8K getting the kind of the art sorted out for this, whereas you're coming up with oh, a yeah, box right. going, there you go, it's all ready to go, and the mechanics are there, we just have to maybe do a bit of time in the development kind of thing. Yeah. Um, the, the I think that's when sort of the graphic designer part becomes a blessing towards the, the end is that mm. if you're going to trans if you're going to do a Kickstarter, you want to have some kind of skills I think that you can bring to the publishing process. Um, I think if you're just a game designer, um, and you've got nothing you can bring to kind of the marketing side of it, the visual side of it, the um, if you're yeah, if you're not an illustrator, a graphic designer, an animator, or anything like that, then that Kickstarter is going to cost you a lot of mm. money, um, and you might not have the the no the knowledge to know visually what's going to work. And Kickstarter is such a visual thing. I mean, people if it doesn't have good art, it doesn't matter really if it's an amazing game, um, probably won't fund. Uh, which is, I mean, we see games that don't have amazing art like go crazy all the time, but I don't think I've ever seen them be Kickstarters. Yeah, maybe it was Terraforming Mars Kickstarter. Ah, uh, don't get me started on Terraforming Mars. <laughs> that's literally, that's literally like when you know the old paperclip popped up on Windows and said, <laughs> "I see you're game. trying to design a game. <laughs> would you like to see? Would you like to see some pic- some pictures from my stock footage?" Um, it's quite funny because there is a kind of an ongoing joke between me and Stronghold about um terraforming mars i always said that they should do like a a version of horses from hell um and call it terror farming mares basically i mean that's what that's what i thought they should go with it um yeah terraforming let's let's not because it's like it's one of the questions if you want to get into their facebook group or private group one of the questions is do you like terraforming mars no <laughs> Or yes, or no in capitals. And that's mm. like one of the questions. It's always been a joke. It's just like my whole thing about Terraforming Mars was I did play it and I had a really, really bad time. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I had a really, really, and it just kind of put me off actually kind of like, it was like one of these things where like everything, do you know how you learn the game and everything that could possibly happen in a game to go wrong? Mm-hmm. It was just a generally, I didn't get half the rules. I didn't understand kind of half the rules. Half the rules weren't explained well. Halfway through the game, that stupid magazine thin paper thing that controls all your stuff. Somebody bumped the table, so all yeah. my cubes went to one side. Classic. I just not not so that that is my story of my 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 kind of dislike for terraforming Mars. But that is kind of a key example of like I think the when you're going to self publish a game, the for me it's a design project too. Like, uh, this is a portfolio piece of me, I guess, because I can kind of use this in my, you know, professional life and say, okay, I, I did all this stuff myself, you know, I hired the illustrators and things yeah, like yeah. that. There's definitely a lot of transferable skills there, which means I could keep that cost down. Um, and it's a lot of work, but it's very rewarding. I mean, that, yeah. that's why I didn't bother publishing it. Um, going to publishers because I knew I was going to self-publish it just because I was, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of up for this challenge. I think I've got, uh, there's enough kind of crossover skills in my day job um, that I really think I can kind of do this well. Um, I don't regret it. It's it's fun. It's a, It's been a really good challenge. Like I, I learned so much from this. I learned, I've learned so much preparing for this kickstart campaign about marketing and things like that other skills that you have to have than i have in my day job for the last you know few years how did um what was it like stepping into the world of um of kind of marketing because i'm guessing that you know in your job that you would have kind of you've probably if you're talking about kind of i guess kind of briefs and meetings and stuff like that 
that you would have probably spent some time in the presence of the marketing departments of some places, probably some time kind of shaking your head and going, <laughs> bloody can't do that, what are you talking about, you idiot? <laughs> but was it a kind of a strange situation to be in um, on the other side where going, oh my goodness, I really need to kind of... <laughs> I need to get the word out about this game. How am I going to yeah. do that? It's, yeah, it's it's been eye-opening being, yeah, almost the client side, right? I'm, I'm the client at the minute for my myself running this campaign. Um, it's, I think it's everyone's least favourite part of self-publishing is the marketing. It's, the, it's probably the hardest part. It's the bit that you really have to kind of be confident to kind of toot your own horn talk yourself up and this is things that especially to me i'm i hate kind of saying oh yeah i'm, I'm great this is great you know i'm not a big fan of selling or sales in general um and it is marketing is sales i guess like it's you're basically trying to show people or you, you can try and take someone on a journey like i'm trying to communicate to someone why they should love this game in a mm -hmm. very crowded sort of market but there's when it comes to board game design um you don't think about that that there's so many games out there now and it's so hard to kind of find what's different about yours and uh and i think not that's the hardest thing with self-publishing is you go okay it's really hard to be very kind of analytical of it probably if i was getting approached by a game designer uh, yeah self someone trying to self-publish to do the marketing i'd have this much kind of more objective look at it where i can go i think this is going to be the approach we go for you know the the art's really strong in this game or well, this is really strong in this game we're going to really hammer down on that and we're going to do this approach but the the world of kind of corporate design is just uh, of corporate sort of advertising and things like that working is is so different in board game design is one of those things where i don't know if it's a completely unique sort of industry but the customers are so involved in the process um effectively that your backers mm -hmm. will probably see your game and want to see it for like a year prior oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. things where people will come up and go i want to basically see that you've you've been at conventions a year ago and i, I want to see the process and i'm interested in the process which is nice it's great um and it's it's amazing for meeting you kind of meet people at uh, where we've you know exhibited somewhere with a pr early prototype two years ago and they come and back the campaign now and they've kind of been along the process the entire time and that's really lovely that's the ideal but that's the kind of stuff you have to do to fund i think you have to really uh, create connections with people on a very personal level um, at least a lot of people there are always just people who just will see an ad see some nice artwork and back the game but um to get those kind of day one backers in a lot of that has to be through actually almost becoming friends with people um through the game and them seeing a lot of process mm. and that's i can't think of another maybe maybe it is maybe video game sign when people do kind of like alpha I, stuff, yeah i don't even know of video games because i think mm. i think that there's i think even in video games there's like a disconnect i mean i'll get emails from i'll get emails from kind of pr companies for video games you know what i mean yeah. here's Slay, here's our version of slay the spire you know mm. it's called it's called kill the spirit and it's a kind of a multi-combat card game kind of thing but there's a pr company i i don't i don't think and i used to do kind of video game reviews i don't think and this was years ago but i don't think there was any point where i was actually speaking directly to the to the video game designer or sure. the design crew. I think there was always somebody that specialized in the marketing. Mm. Whereas with, I think with board games, because there's so many of them that are not one man crew, but there's so many of them that, um, that it is like one or two people doing kind of a multitude of roles that you can end up speaking to. And that's probably why um, this, this podcast has given me access to so many different people. It's because nine times out of ten, I can actually speak to the owner of the company, the person he. They're also making the decisions. They're usually the game designer. I mean, like a month and a bit ago, I had Jamie Stegmaier on the show, 
Yeah, you know, cool. I can't imagine. I and he, you'd be, you'd be saying, well, one of the most, you know, one of the probably the most successful kind of modern board game kind of publishing companies out there. I couldn't imagine going to say FromSoft <laughs> or you know or mm. Blizzard or or any of these other video game companies even the guy even the company that made like say Slay the Spire I can't imagine rocking up and actually having sending them a message asking them to come on talk on the podcast and them actually saying yes I can you know it's I'm very lucky that I've you know I'm very lucky that I've got that. I mean, like I was joking aside, I mean, I've had like, I've had people from Steamforge on, people from Mantic have been on, you know, I've, I've actually had um, Stephen Bonacore from Stronghold Games and we talked about Terraforming Mars as well. So they've been on the show. <laughs> but I, I can't imagine doing that in the same level of kind of like a video game because there seems to be this kind of, there is this kind of wall of PR and kind of marketing, yeah. or kind, not protection, but they're just not, you know, it just seems to be a bigger industry, maybe with more, kind of more money in it i think the board game communities is a lot more they they care a lot more about who creates their game and uh being it's it's just it's just really unique the the, the stagmire um stonemire approach jamie stagmire if you go to the the website to get say replacement parts mm. he will reply but i assume it's him i can't imagine that he wouldn't it would pretend it was him you know, but he'll reply to all of the comments saying you know We'll sort this out for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean he's very, I mean he's very, very hands on. Yeah, no, no. I mean the the guy's very, very hands on. I can't, as I say, I can't imagine, you know, Shigeru Miyamoto, (laughs) you know, answering comments on kind of like, what do you think of the, you know, what are you going to think about the next kind of Mario game? I can't imagine him kind of chipping in and having anything to kind of kind of do that. But also on the same time of things, and I'm guessing I'm looking at the when I look at your Kickstarter page. There's ve- there's going to be very few people that have provided you with like preview content and video content that are prof- prof- doing this on a professional level, yeah. and what that means is that is what they do as a job. It is still that the, you know. I mean, I no doubt you put a post on the board game reviewers and media page, and to say is anybody interested in doing a preview of this this game and you would have had tons and tons of people and i can guarantee you that probably 90 98 to 99% of them will be getting up the next day to do a kind of like a normal 9 to 5 job and i think that's a huge difference in the kind of the the industry yeah i think you're right i think it's it's super nice but it also means that we're held to like a lot higher standard um because people do know you personally almost you know that mm. they you can't kind of hide behind this kind of it's this the stone my thing that he when something goes wrong he will answer for it himself you know um which yeah, is great i mean he is but yeah like, yeah but it's you can't shrug off things as like oh it's a it's a big company and you know um yeah, you know who to go to. You can contact them directly, and that's that's really unique in in board games of having that kind of level of communication, level of um, like internal knowledge with that. But then also, it's a it's a unique thing where a lot of Kickstarter games that like people are willing to wait a year or two years for their product because they believe in it, and they're happy to kind of purchase something. You know, there are games I think of. There's a few things I've backed that three years later aren't even near sort of thing and yeah i think yeah <laughs> no i think i think we're actually i think we're actually starting to i think we're actually starting to see that now i think that in many ways there's um people are opening their back door to discover they've got a yard full of chickens that have just appeared yeah because i've seen i know like um off the top of my head i mean peterson games um, have been have taken to we're going to develop de- be developing one game at a time. I know that mm. mythic mythic games have uh, they've got like I think a, a game outstanding monstrosity or monster city or something like that. But yeah. but they've also just they've done a massive sale on every single kind of IP that they're currently working with. Um, and they've they're like got a huge sale on at their website i think it's like 40 percent off all of their stuff so i think there's a lot of there's a lot of guys that 
they did well or they were doing really really well during the pandemic over mm. the pandemic they, they were still doing quite well and then all of a sudden kind of shipping costs and costs that were coming in from other places have all kind of hit them and i think they're kind of on the they're kind of the back the back foot um in terms of crown of ash the artwork is amazing oh thank you I mean, there's no two ways about this. I'm getting kind of... When I first looked at it, there was two things I kind of thought. One thing I thought was it reminded me very much, and I don't know if you've seen this game or any of the games. I, I don't know, um, but Catacombs. The okay. art by Quan Chai Moria. Mm-hmm. Um, the the I think it's because a lot a lot of their art is on kind of like a white background when mm. it's just you're completely focused on the kind of character, um, and I've heard a lot of people kind of talk about kind of like the artwork in this is kind of stunning and I think having it kind of almost there and ready to go and can complete kind of does an awful lot to kind of sell yes. the kind of the story and it certainly I gives you. That's... One thing that we've had to do, I think people will, especially small creators, there's, there's a couple of things I think if you're a small creator to get that confidence to people, mm. which is really hard, I think now, because like you said, a lot of things have gone wrong and people have been burned a lot. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Is having a finished product. I think the, the, the days of, of funding a concept is just probably gone yeah. for small creators. Yeah. Um, so this is, I think I've got one outstanding piece of artwork, which actually I think he sent through today. So I'll be announcing that soon. And then it's, that's it. Done. Every piece of artwork is done. Hmm. Um, and I've also, I, mean, like I skipped a step with the pre-production part. So the kind of game you can see behind me, that no one else can see, which is. Uh, Worried that's going to go on fire. It's sitting on the radiator. <laughs> It's um, literally giving me nerves. I'm just expecting it to spark. But this, um, See, that's that... the police. Do you hear that noise, that siren in the background? <laughs> that's the police coming out to arrest you for making me nervous. I've put a kind of a, <laughs> a complaint in. But how we did the, the prototypes is they we got them produced by the, the end factory in China. Mm. So the, the advantage of that is that it's the end stocks. We can, it's basically the, the, the pre-production sample you'd get before going to print mm-hmm. is already here, which mm-hmm. means speeds up that process. Yeah. You're seeing all the final stuff. You know everything's possible. You yeah. have all the conversations you need to have with your, your printer. Yes. But also, it, it takes a lot longer to get to you. It took six months for that to arrive, so there's got a few components in that that aren't mm-hmm. uh, in the final game. But, mm-hmm. the, um, but it's little things like this, I think, that allow... So I've put like a year to deliver, I think, so mm-hmm. by next March, it'll be on people's, it'll be arriving in people's doors. But that's, I've left that pretty conservative. I think a year's for, for a first time creator, I'm like, I'll probably need that year. But I think going forward, this is, it's not a bad thing. I think that you go, okay, it's a finished game. Mm-hmm. Mechanics are, kind of, are done. All the artwork's done. Mm-hmm. I literally just have to sort out whatever stretch goals we've done, which obviously haven't been up, put onto the artwork. And press print and that's it's as streamlined as it can possibly job be. done easy well <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy but it's easy. it definitely proves that you can do it when you're seeing the the content creators using effectively the final copy of the game yes um this isn't one that i've sort of boshed together i think that's the kind of thing that will you've got to it's just building confidence now i think a lot of the confidence in kickstarter model has been knocked and and actually I've been. I've tried to do the kind of Stonemaier thing of being the putting myself on the on the game page and replying to the comments myself and yeah. not pretending I'm this huge company of twenty people because yeah. I think if you pretend you're twenty people, um, people w- will expect you to reply to comments at three in the morning when yes. I'm asleep. Sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, I think people have people. The board game community is a nice community that they'll help you out. If you pretend that you're a 50 man company, um, people expect the kind of service of a 50 man company. They won't yeah. give you the benefit of the doubt. They won't give you, um, the, you know, they'll expect to reply in 20 minutes, which they should, you know, you're be a huge company. But also when your campaign does 30 grand, which like, it's amazing. I'm, I'm excited for that. 
people will be thinking, oh, this is going to be one of those ones that cancels because it didn't get a million. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and there's there was that for a while. I think there was people putting yeah. kind of like five five grand uh, five grand targets and then going, oh, we made our target, but we've not made enough to make a game. And it's like that's not how maths works. <laughs> Basically, it's tricky because the Kickstarter algorithm is like. No, you basically have to fund in those first twenty four hours yeah. for it to push you at all. Yeah. So there is it definitely incentivizes low funding goals. Yes. The Kickstarter. But it's yeah, it just means that if someone sees a low funding goal that's genuine, like I put the funding goal which would basically cover the print cost, the print and freight. So we yeah. get to people's doors. But I wouldn't have I wouldn't have got any of the the illustration money I put in. But I mean, I kept the cost down because I did the design myself, yeah. which definitely means that I didn't have to recoup as big an amount. But I can see why these companies who've got lots of miniatures um, need to fund 500 grand. Or was it the um, was it the the Kingdom Come Deliver? Was that one? Is a Kingdom Death Monster one? Oh, not Kingdom Death. Monster. The did you see the one? It was um, based on a computer game. It was um, I think it was Kingdom Come. Oh right, um, yeah. And it was, they raised, was it $500,000 and they needed a million minimum. Like, I don't know what they were thinking, but but then you think they had the amount of miniatures they had and stuff. Those mold costs, I think people don't understand this when stuff like miniatures, they're really cheap to produce individually, but the mold costs per miniature are probably like three to 5,000 pounds, not including the sculpting cost. So the base cost of each one of those little minis might be five to ten thousand dollars and then you um for a really nice mini if you've got a hundred minis in your game all unique sculpts you could be looking at like a million quids worth of or like 10 grand a pop you've got a hundred minis yeah that's a million quid Hmm. so the actual cost to produce those minis is pennies but the base cost that goes into it could be to get it going yeah hundreds of thousands i mean yeah maybe not a million quid but huge costs so when you've got a game like that, they that's why the funding goal's not genuine because they'll say we actually need two hundred thousand dollars just to get the minis just, paid for. Yeah. Just to just to kinda of make make some money. Which is why I think is when you see games with minis, it's not unusual to see a Kickstarter from the same company again and again and again and again and again. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes it in some cases you're always playing a little bit of catch up. Kind yeah. of financially, unless you've got like a game that's got a tail. In terms of funding, mm-hmm. what's the cost of entry on Crown of Ash? It's forty five pounds. Is the base game, right? Which is about, I think it's about fifty three dollars, fifty four dollars, something like that, fifty two euros. I look, look. Let's check. I'm going on it. I'm yeah, going on, on it just now. I'm going it's to look it on. Does it does the rates. Change. It does actually. It's fifty four US dollars and fifty one euros, and then you've got the Crown a- Crown of Ash Deluxe pledge. Yes, the Deluxe pledge adds in basically nice screen printed bags that yes. speed up the the start of the game. So you can basically just hand each player their sort of starting stuff, and you're good to go. Uh, also, some special dice and some nice enamel control tokens. Or and then, that. and then for eighty pounds, you've got the All In Pledge, which contains the 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 Rising Fighters module, thirty seven fighter standees, and then now seems a stretch goal. Yeah, and then you've got the silly the founders, the big money, the six hundred pound founders pledge, which has got like everything. They, you they get a hand signed prototype copy. Yeah, you know that that's going to be. I mean, that's there. If someone the the thing about they say about Kickstarter is you shouldn't put like a ceiling on what people are willing to give, especially to small time creators, because there are people out there who will be who will just really want to help you out, and potentially six hundred dollars is six hundred pounds is is just not a lot to them. Mm, <laughs> like, yeah, that's a lot to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it helps, um, you know, bring out some of those costs, but on stuff like the the prototypes and things like that which are expensive uh but yeah so the i've never i've kind of tried to be as nice as possible with the um the pledges like there's no there's no gameplay stuck behind a a paywall yeah 
the deluxe and the all in stuff it basically just adds in nice to haves there's yes. it streamlines a few of the things like the the little miniature the not miniatures the standees um they look good but also just that allows you to speed up the end game scoring so there is sort of a practical purpose to them as well you yeah. basically when you raise your fighter you replace it with the standee and then you put that card in a little pile beside you and then when you do the end game scoring for the fighters you've raised it's just there in a stack whereas on the the base game you, you just have to take them back off the board yeah yeah not that big a deal but there is a functional process saves a bit of time but gameplay wise you get the same game if you want to spend 45 pounds or want to spend 80 pounds cool but cool. yeah it's um pricing's a, a a bit of a dark art <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where it's it's tricky but I've, I've tried to be really clever with the i think this is where having a print design background really helps too is i know where the costs become in high or higher in in print production so you know, all the punch boards are all the same die cut which basically means they only have to drill out one piece of yeah like, one die. yeah um and then you're just paying for like you actually then get the advantage of three punch boards is it's like you're spending three times as much or yeah. th- ordering three times as much um and little things like that so i've tried to be as as, re- as clever as possible with the <laughs> components and things to bring that cost down to I can, but even forty five pounds, that's it's tough to make any money on this. So that if I if I get my money if I break even I'll be ecstatic. <laughs> this is I, I I I would I was always like and this is an open invitation if you're listening to this and if you have done a Kickstarter and it's been funded, I'd love somebody to come on and just break go through all of the costs. Everything from oh. I'd love somebody to just go right. Okay, this is how much we spent on previews. This is how much we spent on art. This is how much we spent on production. This is how much we spent on kind of uh, freight shipping mm. mistakes, you know, errata errors, everything like that, and just to get a full. But you know, I think it's. I think it's still one of these things where again, it's kind of like it's very personal to each person that it becomes the kind of their baby. And again, I think you know, going back to. To Jamie, he's Jamie Stegmar. He has released kind of like this is the balance sheet. This is what we've sold, which is I yeah. think is a, is kind of like it kind of gives it gives you kind of a good indication of where things are. Um, if people are looking for an indication of where you are, where can you find you on the internet webs, Mister Lawton? So things like uh, Instagram, Facebook, it's Card Noir, um, which is uh, yeah, the com- that's the publishing name. Uh, there is a Crown of Ash group or Crown of Ash. If you Google that, they'll come up with the Crown of Ash website and cool. lead you to the Kickstarter. But yeah, um, I'm mainly I'm an Instagram guy. I'm a I think that's that's where I sit. That's where I go kind of, um, spend the most time. So yeah, you can add me on Instagram. Uh, I think it's, I think it's just card underscore noir. So you go. And what I'll do is I'll put all the links in the show notes so that we've got notes to show if you want to keep an eye on what we're up to then just go to the internet webs and search for we're not wizards and you'll find us in all the different places where the internet webs kind of hang out online on the electric server things i don't know um you'll find us on facebook and twitter and we've got our blog which is we're not wizards tabletop.com you can find the podcast and we're not wizards.com you can find us in all the different podcast catchers of choice if you are somebody who, if you are somebody who's designing, developing, marketing the game, anything to do in the tabletop industry, if you're in social media, anything along those lines, and you fancy coming on and having a chat, then drop us a message and uh, we'll talk about getting you on at some point. If you like what you've listened to tonight, then consider, go as I say, going to the Apple Podcast and giving us a rating or giving us a review. If you are going to be giving us a rating, then don't give us... Don't give us 10 stars because it makes me big-headed. But on the other side, don't give us a one star because it makes me cry. Give me something in the middle, like a five, because it's average. I'm just a little bit average. But the person who's not been average is rather wonderful, rather fantastic, Mr. Richard Lawton. Thank you for guesting on the show. And there's only a couple more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we're many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Richard? I don't think so. Don't. That's not the answer I was looking for. Uh, (laughs) And the second thing is to say goodbye. (laughs) So it's... Everybody's doing this at the moment. It's really annoying me. 
Um, it's <laughs> it's a goodbye from Richard. Say goodbye, Richard. Goodbye. And it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe, roll sixes, make something awful, and get yourself a crown of ash. I don't know what's going to rhyme with mash. Instead of some potato mash, get yourself a crown of mash. <laughs> um, and but until the next time, goodbye. <laughs> A wizard is never linked. Is he early? He arrives precisely when he means to. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>